via Zoom during the corona crisis of 2021. Hi, I'm Frank Spidell, retired emergency physician and recovering hospital administrator, and welcome to The Doctor's Inn. Today's episode is The Times Are Changing, Not Again. For our discussion today, I invite your doubt and skepticism, for as the great physicist and humanist Richard Feynman reminded us, science is the organized skepticism and the reliability of expert opinion, adding, I'd rather have questions that can't be answered than answers which can't be questioned. To Professor Feynman's invitation for skepticism, I would add the observations of astrophysicist Carl Sagan seemingly forgotten during the COVID-19 pandemic. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Now, I am neither an epidemiologist, public health official, nor infectious disease specialist. Always defer for your health care guidance to your primary care physician, your local and state health departments, and the CDC. Sadly, as I wrote the introduction to today's show, we had lost more than 568,000 Americans COVID-19. And with metronomic rhythm, agencies and labeled experts in public health produce statements that bemuse, confuse, and abuse. So COVID-19 is spread or not spread by, by aerosol transmission. I think it is. And I think that pre-pandemic medical literature indicated respiratory pathogens, even tuberculosis, are aerosol spread transmissions. Yet aerosol spread was, uh, was a controversy for the CDC. And who can forget the curious, passionate declarations involving reopening of schools in person for education? My ears are still ringing from definitive declaration by experts that six feet was the absolute minimum separation for schools and reopening all while simultaneously acknowledging that schools are not drivers of transmission. Um, that six foot absolute has enjoyed revision too. Now, since the last show, I learned that Dr. Rochelle Walensky, the CDC director, observed that those who are vaccinated do not carry the virus. No surprise here. Only to learn later, the CDC was not comfortable with Dr. Walensky's observations. And then within a week, we were told that the vaccinated could travel without significant risk followed by the cynically expected walk back advisory for mitigation of travels. In following public health direction, and they don't have an easy job, I certainly understand that. One is reminded of the quote from Robert Bolt's A Man for All Seasons, where Thomas More says to his passionate, gifted with certainty but not insight, son-in-law, Will Roper, we must pray that when your head's finished turning, your face is to the front again. Before the emergency use authorization by the FDA of vaccines, the CDC appropriately considered how to advise on allocating this life-saving resource. I found their recommendations curiouser and curiouser. The Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices in the CDC in December of 2020 posted and identified as the highest priority healthcare personnel and residents of long-term care facilities. And healthcare personnel is specifically defined elsewhere as those who had the potential for direct and indirect exposure to patients or infectious materials, including body substances, that is blood, tissue, or specific body fluids. Now reading this, one would think that the term healthcare personnel is well-defined and doesn't allow for much mischief. Not so. In Chester County, where I live, the local health department was featured in a December 2020 local evening news broadcast showing a 22-year-old dispatcher, identified by the TV reporter as young and healthy, being vaccinated. This reporting occurred while 74-year-olds with COPD were two categories back in phase 1C. The optics were bad and the rationale was non-existent. There were similar other pungent revelations, such as members of Congress, the VP, President-elect, the VP-elect, and their spouses being among the first to be immunized. So the result of all this was the Health and Human Services moved 65 to 74-year-olds and 16 to 64s with comorbid conditions to phase one, 
alongside that of the 22-year-old healthy dispatcher. The simple problem is this. The healthcare policy where everyone gets a prize and everyone is 1A doesn't work in a world of finite resources and finite vaccines. When everyone is 1A, no one is 1A. The lack of prioritization in 1A left seniors scrambling like teens for concert tickets. Which brings me to the curiouser part. What were the CDC goals? I've read and heard many goals proposed for vaccine allocations specifically to minimize mortality, to optimize life years preserved, not the same as the first. If I save a 16 year old, I save more life year or expected life years than if I save a 79 year old. Contain transmission of the disease, preserve needed functions in society, promote the well being of society, promote fairness, and just maybe, just maybe, acquire political capital and influence. The first time I saw CDC define goals as opposed to soothing aspirations was on 25 March, 2021. At that time, the stated goals were to decrease death and serious disease as much as possible, to preserve functioning of society, and to reduce the extra burden COVID-19 is having on people already facing disparities. I note again that the goals are more aspirational than operational. Perhaps I have lost perspective. For me, the answer is simpler, and it's operationally Spidel proof. Unless there is a contradiction, vaccinate the oldest first and work down by birth years. Why? Look at the CDC's published data on hospitalizations and mortalities. This is a disease that exponentially kills by age. The 65 to 74 year old age group is 1300 times more likely to die than the 15 to 19 year old baseline reference group. That's not just a factor of 13 more likely, that's a factor of 13 and two orders of magnitude more likely to die. The 75 to 84 year old group drops out with a factor of 3200. Now to provide a sense to the spin cycle swirl of facts and factoids, I am profoundly honored to have as our guest today, Dr. Robert Wachter, Chair of the Department of Medicine at the School of Medicine at the University of California in San Francisco. Now, one of my heroes when I was growing up in medicine was Dr. Lewis Thomas, the Dean of the Yale School of Medicine. Dr. Thomas celebrated and loved medicine, but he also extended far beyond medicine. Dr. Thomas avidly wrote about all in nature and the human experience. He's gone now. But Walk, Dr. Walker is carrying on Dr. Thomas's tradition of the physician who explores and embraces more than simply medicine. He writes extremely well. His writing is clear, lucid, relevant, and insightful. Dr. Walker also shares the distinction of being along with Jimmy Buffett, the only person I have ever written a fan letter to. I invite you to read Dr. Wachter's The Digital Doctor. Hope, Hype, Harm, and the Dawn of America's Computer of Medicare, Medicine's Computer Age. It was deservedly a New York Times bestseller. And I think it ought to win the Nobel Prize in Medicine. For beyond the technical exploration of IT and medicine, the digital doctor celebrates the joy, beauty, and values of medicine done well. Professor Walker, I welcome you to the doctor as in. And what did I get wrong? A uh, little too too much praise. I think you read my mother's facts, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> otherwise. Uh, not wrong exactly. I guess I'm a little more sympathetic to the plight of public health officials who are trying to, uh, you know, deal with the fog of war, deal with changing facts, changing understanding, and come out with guidelines that have to be uh, simple enough for people to understand and therefore, in some ways, always are going to uh, step on some nuance. Uh, but, you know, overall, I, I do think, you know, it, it, people have felt a little bit jerked around. The things have changed as we've gone along. 
the uh, the prioritization scheme, I also agree, could have been simpler. That age uh, very clearly, by many orders of magnitude, trumps many of the other things that uh, uh, that ended up being thrown into the mix. And I think we ended up with something that was more chaotic um, and probably less effective in saving lives than we could have than we could have. But uh, it's a really tough, tough problem. And uh, so maybe I have a little more sympathy, but uh, but as we go on, maybe we'll find that I don't. Uh, I learn from you all the time. And uh, I, I, I hope I did qualify in there. It's not an easy job they do. Uh, you have 8 trillion critics, and uh, it's very, very tough to put together a policy that people have to act on. It's easy for commentators like me uh, to spout and talk. I don't have to do a policy at the end of the day. Uh, now, uh, I want to pick your brain. I, th I think most in science are, are, are not just comfortable with change, but actively uh, question and explore things newly. Uh, I was in the front lines on, in the ER in the 80s when AIDS appeared. And uh, we didn't know much then. Uh, there was confusion and uncertainty. But for some reason, uh, not just those providing care, but I thought society as a whole seemed to do a better job at managing the uncertainty. Uh, in this pandemic, it seems we're spring-loaded to have primal, visceral arguments, not the reflective discussions that usually make things better. Am I off on this? Uh, I think you may have airbrushed the '80s. I kind of I lived through <laughs> I lived through the same thing. I, I, I there, there's part of that that I think is is right and resonates with me, and part of it, I think we've all forgotten some of the battles uh, and some of the political missteps. So the pre, you know AIDS was enormous and killed you know, hundreds of thousands of people in the first several years, and the president of the United States did not mention it in a speech. Uh, until six years into the epidemic. Um, and it was for different reasons than uh, than some of the political missteps that we saw last year. The main reason that it was hitting a certain population that was stigmatized and that the government really didn't want to, to focus on. So the controversies were very real, but I think I, I agree with you on the science. I think that um, uh, there was a period of uncertainty for about the first year. I remember it was I was in medical school, actually, in Philadelphia at Penn at the time when the first AIDS cases were uh, were reported. And we had no idea what it was, how it was spread, whether we were going to get it from going into a room. Um, but it seemed like fairly quickly when the science got worked out, uh, people kind of saluted and said, OK, that's how it spreads. Here's what we need to do to try to find a vaccine, which, of course, we have not done 40 years later. Uh, here, we're look up, going to look for treatments. Here's how, what you have to do to protect yourself. So I think the main difference was HIV AIDS. The scientific response was cleaner, and the political response didn't really step on the scientific response nearly as much. But the political response was fraught in part because of the populations were hit. COVID's different. COVID, you know, everyone was at risk of COVID. It affected everybody's life. AIDS didn't really shut down the society, didn't shut down the economy, didn't shut down society. Uh, but the political divide was in some ways just as big. What was strange about COVID was, uh, you know, I mean, I thought this, the, this, the, the, the issue about uncertainty and change uh, felt very real in COVID, in part for because for those of us in science and in medicine, it was pretty familiar. Here's a new thing. We don't really understand it, a new disease. We don't understand it. Let's wait and see what trusted sources say about it. And there's going to be one step forward and two steps back, and there's going to be changes in guidance. I think because it affected everybody's life so deeply in terms of whether you're going to get sick, whether you're going to die, and also your business is shut down, you're staying at home, you're, you're hiding under the table. The public was watching intensely what was going on, and the public is not used to the scientific process. So for the public, uh, this idea that, you know, masks are, are, we don't need masks, okay, yes, we do, uh, you know, clean the mail, no, you don't have to, all that kind of stuff was profoundly unsettling. And then in the political moment that we find ourselves in, became fodder for a partisan divide. And, and the partisan divide, sort of the baseline status of the United States, is this massive questioning of expertise and of science 
And so sort of the substrate for uh, a chaotic and, off, and, and ultimately pretty unproductive response uh, was there because the uncertainty then bled into the politics, which I don't think was quite the same situation in the 1980s. I have to agree with you a thousand percent. Um, one of the first guests I had on to talk about uh, the pandemic and SARS-2 uh, was back in March of uh, 2020. And he made the comment, uh, not for not for the air, that this was a witch's brew because it was aligning an election cycle with an unknown that had terrible consequences. And he said, this will be weaponized. The response to this will be used as a political club, that the more dramatic the response by those who had power, the, the person who is running for office wants to be seen as doing the big dramatic things to pound that disease on the head and get that virus, right? And you heard, I heard that rhetoric all the time. And I have sadly a sense that that actually permeated into organizations that I used to look at as being beyond politics and being kind of academic sites that would just, you know, discuss, analyze and formulate what we should do. Let's read the CDC here. That all of a sudden, what you were saying, what was being said by people that were valued as scientists was done through the filter of the political impact it had. I could be off on this, but I don't remember that during the AIDS pandemic. No, I think that's right. I think the 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 problem with AIDS was at the kind of at the presidential level, <clears throat> the inability to and unwillingness to highlight it as a priority. Interestingly, the support for organizations like the CDC and the NIH was reasonably good. And certainly there wasn't much mucking around with the, you know, the scientific process in the CDC. The CDC very rapidly emerged as a trusted source. It always was, but there was nothing that, that, that got in the way of that. It was not that the political challenges that HIV brought forward uh, led to the political process polluting the, the, the work of the CDC. This was very different. I mean, this really was... Uh, it's very clear now as the dust has settled and we hear about what was going on in the CDC and the FDA, that their hands were tied. You know, these are world-class organizations with very smart people who are simply not allowed to say what they believe to be true. Uh, and so they very quickly lost credibility. It created a leadership and information vacuum that quickly got filled with sometimes nonsense, sometimes uh, truly, you know, mistruths. And um, I'd say the other difference, Frank, from the 80s was the the presence of social media, which yeah. didn't exist, of course, in the 80s. And so the I'd, I'd add to your guests, who I think was quite prescient, uh, to, to the, the, the toxic stew there, the witch's brew, you add an information vacuum will be filled in a nanosecond with uh, partisanized craziness and, uh, and, and choose your own facts. Uh, you know, there was really no, op in, in the 80s, you know, where did you get your information from? You waited for Walter Cronkite to tell you what, to, what the truth was. There were kind of no alternative information sources and no information sources that bypassed trusted gatekeepers. Uh, that's none of that is true anymore. It's it's true. It's, it, it's actually even tr uh, a fact in the scientific world. You know, you can, as a scientist, used to be if you want to write something, you had to get through the editor at JAMA or the New England Journal. Now you stick it on Twitter, or you do a preprint, or you send out a press release, all that. So I think it's that combination of of the creation of a massive information vacuum at a time where everybody needed information, was desperate for information, a lot of uncertainty, uh, and also the run up to a political election in our most partisan time in history, with then a way to fill that information vacuum without uh, trusted intermediaries and trusted filters, uh, created just. I mean, I look back on 2020, and it's just remarkable that it happened. And politically, also, 
so counterproductive from the standpoint, and not only did the political response, I believe, was it responsible for the deaths of several hundred thousand Americans, which Dr. Birx just uh, admitted recently, uh, but it really didn't have to be. And if the party in power had taken the crisis and done the right thing, I'm quite confident that the that the Republican Party would still be in charge. Crises usually provide opportunities for leaders to emerge, get consensus, and uh, and, and emerge as heroes. You know, look at Bush after uh, 9-11 or Giuliani after 9-11. It's not that hard to do if you do the right thing. What could they have done? Uh, turn the clock back. It's February. What should have been done? What could the then current administration of... of uh, President Trump, what could they have done back then that would have made a big difference? Well, I, I actually have an easy answer for this because I live in San Francisco where the political response was quite good, in part because it's actually an extremely homogeneous political environment. And very early on, the mayor, public health officials said, this is serious. We don't understand all the facts, but we've got to pay attention we simply have to close things down until we understand this better. That will come at a cost, we understand, to the economy and people's lives, but it's the right thing to do. And we will we'll tell you what we know, we'll tell you what we don't know. Uh, and people really began trusting the city leadership to do the right thing. A year Now, San Francisco has some natural advantages, a relatively wealthy city, a lot of tech people who could you know, be on Zoom during the day and Netflix at night, all those sort of things. The weather's decent, uh, so people could spend more time outside. But that said, even adjusting for all those things, we still have not had our 500th death in San Francisco. Uh, comparable size cities have had 10 times as many deaths. Los Angeles is about 10 times bigger than uh, than San Francisco, it's had more than 20,000 deaths. New York, more than 30,000. San Francisco, about 450 deaths since this thing started. If the U.S. had mirrored San Francisco's per capita death rate, uh, there would be about 350,000 people alive today that are that are dead. So I I don't think it would have been that hard. What what would have had to have happened, and I think it has happened. We've seen what it looks like in in this current administration. This is the most important thing in the world right now. We will tell you what we know. We will tell you what we don't know. We will work our tails off to find out the answers to them. We will focus on this like a laser. We have to come together to do the right thing, not have this be a partisan football. We're going to invest what it takes to, 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 to deal with this. We understand we have to balance the economy and the public health, and we'll do the best we can to balance it. And uh, we are going to defer to the scientists. This is not going to be a political response. It's going to be a scientific response based on emerging scientific facts. I think that would have worked. It still would have been terrible. I mean, there still would have been, I think, a couple hundred thousand people that died, but not 600,000. And uh, uh, I actually don't think it would have been that hard. But the administration at the time saw this only as threat, saw this only as uh, therefore had to minimize it. Uh, which, of course, the facts on the ground made clear very early that that just was was not right, um, and then had to partisanize it. And therefore, you know, people, it, it, it dichotomized the, the world into, I mean, the fact that mass became a sign of what team you were on <laughs> is, 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 you know, is flabbergasting. But uh, so I think there's there's so many things that could have been done differently. I, I you know, I want to give credit where credit is due. First, and, 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 and sympathy where the sympathy is due. Really hard problem. There was no possibility of political leadership that would not that would have prevented it from being massively tragic, uh, and even you know even with the perfect political response, it would have been a pretty terrible, terrible thing. And the vaccines, which now are getting us out of this pickle, uh, are a were a tremendous triumph for the Trump Trump administration. I don't think there's any way you can look at the uh, the Operation um, Warp Speed and not say uh, organized really well, exactly the right thing to do. And not only am I praise, uh, do I praise the Trump administration for it, but I actually think their response was probably better than we would have gotten in a democratic administration because their instinct was, you know, trust the private sector, give it some money and kind of leave it alone. And I think that a democratic administration probably would have mucked around with it more. There would have been more, there would have been more process, you know, 
figure out who's which firms are you know should be chosen and uh, you know an application process and looking at all of the interest groups and make sure they're all represented all that kind of stuff I think it would have been slower so they got that one right and that's really important but I think they got almost everything else wrong <laughs> I, I think you have a lot of company in that company in that view uh, you're an educator a very prominent educator in medicine you, your residents and and fellows and, and all the other people that provide uh, clinical care you're you're providing direction to uh, you are what I affectionately call, you're a silverback uh, professor. Uh, you're the one who keeps the troop safe from the uh, saber-toothed animals that we share the jungle with. You're helping the next group figure out how to do things. What would you share lessons learned clinically? Uh, I, I, one pops to mind clinically, which I has been around for a while. Uh, clinically, but also as far as approach to problems. What were the things you want to pass on to those who follow? Yeah, I think the analogies to AIDS are, are, are important here. I think one of the things that comes through here is that uh, the lens that we teach uh, medical students, my, I have a daughter who's a medical student, so I see it, Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. She's great. And we, you know, we we turn them from lay people into professionals and experts. And typically the lens that we have given them to wear is clinical. They understand how to diagnose things. They understand how to treat things and how to prognosticate. I think COVID exposes, I was a political science major in college. I always thought like, what does that have to do with medicine? And yet I think it served me pretty well because I think having the lens of uh, the way we attack hard problems in medicine is not just about the clinical care, is not just about the, the treatments and the, the data. It's, it, has to un, uh, it has to take into account and influence society, politics, policy, economics. I mean, you know this from, from your world of being a healthcare leader and, 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 and a practitioner, that you, you can't just look at the medical piece of it. You have to look at all all parts of the chicken are important. <laughs> I think yeah, COVID made that infinitely clear that the response, if you're going to respond appropriately to this thing, it was not just going to be about the disease and the drugs and the vaccine. It was also about racial issues and political issues and economic issues and how do you change behavior and how do you gain consensus? And I think that's true for most of medicine, but I think I think that's probably the main takeaway lesson uh, that uh, that our trainees need to take away from from COVID. You're sharing an, an old axiom that has stuck with me by one of the silverbacks who I was fortunate to know. He, he, he looked at me and he, Spidell, the secret for caring for the patient is to care for the patient. And uh, that part of medicine has to be reinforced because it is a very difficult and very burning uh, transition from a lay person to somebody who is going to be there for people on their worst moments. Sure. You have to, and you just very well in your writing. I, I love the, you never lose sight of that perspective of there are human beings involved here. And at the end of the day, we're all fallible. And at the end of the day, we all need love and help. Uh, pick your brain on this one. Uh, I saw a transition from just looking at numbers when we were deciding on therapy for somebody in respiratory failure, just looking at numbers like uh, pulse oxes to how's the patient doing? Uh, I thought that was refreshing to see for a change. Uh, certainly ventilatory care, we changed from, we now are six to eight centimeters uh, per kilogram, as opposed to one time it was like 10 to 15. And we medicine has certainly grown, but I also enjoyed seeing people were looking beyond uh, what is permissible hypoxia in our care of patients. Comments about that? Well, you know, knowledge, I've been at this long enough to know that things that were immutable truths chiseled on tablets when I was in training are now, you know, people, when I tell, when I say that to a medical student, they, you, they say, you got to be kidding. Like we used to transfuse people for a hemoglobin less than 11 or, you know, any of this stuff, it changes. But I, I guess I'd like highlight the point about the tension between the data and the humanity in medicine. It really is it's very profound. And as we're awash in more and more data, more and more facts, more and more, you know, and it's going to get bigger and bigger with AI and the computers, 
it's easy to just stare at the computer all day long. It's easy to look at the data all day long and forget there's a person there. And 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 COVID made it worse because if you're wearing a mask and PPE, it separates you from the patients and their families even more than previously. So it's constantly attention. How do we use the data in the service of patients, but forget that these are people and not widgets? You're, not you're, forget that, yeah. You're, you're, I have to affirm that so much. Uh, the mask has helped tremendously, but it's also placed another barrier. Yeah. And our tendency to sit in front of the screen and treat the screen, uh, electronic health records, as you know, I've, I've argued has created the highest class of uh, highest paid group of data entry clerks in Western civilization. Mm -hmm. not, not the best of times. Any surprises during the pandemic, Professor? Well, I think what we've talked about already is probably my biggest surprise. The, the politicization of, of it has was shocking, uh, shocking to me. The, the good surprise is the vaccines. I mean, if you had said to me in last April that we would have uh, injected you know, almost half of the adult population in the United States with a massively effective, incredibly safe vaccine by April of 2021, I would have asked what you're smoking. <laughs> I'm just uh, almost inconceivable how science has bailed us out here and uh, shouldn't be surprised, but that was that is really surprising. That's that's the happy surprise in all of this. The groundwork for that, I'm always happy to share with people, was not uh, Operation Warp Speed per se, I think, my opinion. If you go back to the summer of 2019, the President's Council on Economic Advisors was tasked with devising a new de novo approach to a pandemic, a threatening pandemic. And all the elements that were brought forth and operationalized in the warp speed thing was there in this council of economic advisors. They weren't, they weren't people that normally you'd associate, but they had the concept of uh, going for a, a novel vaccine approach that could be manufactured and modified quickly. I mean, they, 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 chat, they grabbed onto all the things that I think made a difference of, of purchase orders before FDA authorization, things that would take the risk out of and then doing purchase orders, not just with one firms, but multiple firms with multiple vaccine pipes. I, I'm forever impressed that those people deserve more recognition for their thoughts in the summer of 2019. Well, I think you could, you know, you could argue that there should be a Nobel Prize for all of that because, uh, you know, just as the political response cost several hundred thousand li lives in the U.S. and probably you could argue millions of lives in the world, the vaccine response has, has saved that many lives, yes. and uh, it's it is it is breathtaking and should definitely uh, uh, you know we we need to take every opportunity to praise that because uh, it's amazing where we find ourselves at today. Uh, I hear a lot about uh, maybe because I'm old. I've heard a lot about people talking about burnout in medicine. Uh, I think the stressors were always there, but for some reason, uh, it's, it seems to be more in the speak right now. It seems to be more common. Uh, I've had both the blessing and liability of having been on many medical staffs at many different institutions. I sense that some medical staffs, some institutions have a microculture that preserves people in their medicine, in their careers, and in their helpfulness, while other institutions and staffs tend to chew through human beings in medicine. Have you ever seen that before? I think most of your career has been at, uh, well, tell me about your career. Where have you been? I haven't moved very much. I, you know, I grew up in New York. I went to college and med school at Penn. I came out to UCSF for my residency, thinking that I'd come to California for three years and come to the Northeast. And I have basically been there ever since. I did a fellowship in policy and ethics and epidemiology at Stanford, but otherwise uh, have stayed in Northern California my entire career. I've had the chance to be visiting professor at lots of places, uh, had a Fulbright and spent a year in England. So I've traveled around a little bit, but uh, but I've been at UCSF for my entire time, and it's a it's a magnificent place with a terrific culture. But there is plenty of burnout. I think the uh, uh, you know the world of medicine today, the 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 amount of data that 
physicians and nurses and others have to keep track of, as you say, the the turning doctors into glorified and not particularly glorified grumpy data entry clerks by the computers is, is, is tough. I think the computers have also created an expectation of being on 24 seven with oh, yeah. data coming at you 24 seven with patients being able to access you 24 seven uh, with no business model for that. You know, the lawyer, lawyers figured this out a long time ago. They charge people for every six minutes. That's not how the life of physicians work. So it's, we've got to kind of resort all of that out. Uh, you know, I mean, it's all good for patients in a way that, that their, that their healthcare system is more easily accessible to them. But the amount of burden that the computer has 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 placed on clinicians is tremendous. It sometimes feels to me like uh, if you had a baby and the baby cried all the time and never smiled at you, and you would you would just say like, what's the point here? And the computers are kind of like that, where you spend so much time feeding them, uh, but you get so little useful information and 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 insight out of them. I, that'll flip at some at some point when you think about what the computers do for us in managing our travel or managing our finances, managing the rest of our lives. You know, I think you would say net they help us much more than than, than hurt us. I think in medicine it's a mixed bag, but I, I'm quite confident it's going to get better. And even some of the things I've seen in the last few years give me a lot of confidence it's going to get better. But right now it's a I think very very tough time to be a clinician. Yeah, and I I think that uh, I'm sad to say this I. There was a certain deference that was given to physicians that I grew up in. I think you probably grew up in it too. Uh, that uh, is is somewhat frayed compared to what it used to be. There was, uh, if you're a good doc, you had you were at the top of uh, what was worthwhile in our society. I'm not sure that's true anymore. Maybe that's for the better. I don't know. I used yeah, to. I think it's. I think it's mixed. I think like a lot of things. You know, one of the things that the technology does is democratize the field and provides, uh, you know, takes away some of the hierarchy that you are the priest, you are the person with all of the knowledge and insight. The patient comes to you and is, 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 is you know, and then we make it worse by putting them in a gown where their butt is sticking out. And, and you know, it, there's a whole lot about medicine that creates this very hierarchical relationship that I think at the end of the day is probably not healthy. And so negotiating a new normal where we, where patients are empowered and have information to help themselves manage themselves, uh, but, but also, you know, recognize the expertise and the sweat that physicians put into doing what they do. Uh, you know, I think we have to figure out that new normal. It's never going to be Marcus Welby again. It's never going to be physician as high priest patient uh, with coming to the encounter with, with no standing and no knowledge and just an empty vessel. I, th I think that's not healthy, not good for patients, but uh, uh, we got we to gotta negotiate a new way of sort of respecting each other. And I think we'll get there. Uh, you, you, before the show, I, I asked you about your next book. Uh, Professor, you absolutely have the next book in you. I, I would love to see you talk on the the growth in the growth of medicine compared to when you and I first started, we put our little short white coats on uh, what's changed and what's remained the same uh, in reading, uh, in reading uh, the digital doctor, I sensed the things that I valued so much in medicine. I think you're a fellow traveler in them. Uh, there's a wonderful decency about watching really motivated, educated people get together and figure out how can we make this patient's worlds better. The, the celebration, uh, I remember in a community hospital, I used to love Saturday morning breakfast rounds where the, the both the youngest and the oldest members of the staff after they were doing their rounds would get together over coffee and donuts. I heard, uh, uh, the grand rounds level discussions over really stale donuts and coffee uh, by people that just celebrated and enjoyed the passion of being honored and privileged to care for other people. Yeah. I hope we don't lose that in medicine. Is that yeah. still going on? Do you see that? It, it is. It's, it's different. Um, uh, and the last year has robbed us of it. So, yeah. you know, of, when we think about, you know, the many tragedies of the past year in medicine, I mean, the biggest one, it's hard to, 
nothing stands up to the idea of patients dying alone and having their loved ones say goodbye to them over uh, over FaceTime. Uh, you know, it's almost it's almost hard to talk about any other loss. But 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 in in the medical world, you know, our residents now are sitting off by themselves, or it's getting better now. But for the past year, the attendings doing much of their work from home and doing televisits. You know, all reasonable pivots given the facts on the ground in terms of this virus. But it means that the communal sharing of information, whether it's it's social information or just chatting about a tough case, uh, was much, much harder to come by. So that's one of the things I really look forward to getting back to as we're able to congregate again, sitting in the same conference room. You know, Zoom was a good, Zoom was better than nothing, but it's not as good as the real thing. It's not the, it's not the same. Last question. Uh, doctor, who were your heroes in medicine? Oh, you know, I, my, probably my greatest hero is, uh, was my main mentor, who was a guy named Lee Goldman, uh, who just stepped down as dean at Columbia, but was my boss for many, many years. And Lee taught me um, how to strive for excellence and how to, um, how to be better, how people could be better than they thought they could be if pushed in the right way. And, 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 and that's a tricky thing to do, how to sort of push people in the right way without creating more stress than is necessary. Um, he taught me how to be strategic, how to think about, uh, you know, the chessboard and, you know, where we need to go. Uh, that, you know, he was a very important figure for me, but there, I've seen, I've had a lot of people in medicine who have taught me the importance of understanding society, understanding people. Atul Gawande is another one who, uh, you know, just as I read and have spoken to Atul many times over the years, uh, the, the sort of deep humanity of what they're, they understand that medicine is fundamentally a human profession, but also understand that the system has to be changed and, uh, you know, and what are the tools to change the system in a better way. Those are the people that have influenced my career in a major way. Uh, I noticed that Atul is somebody who is, I think, a generation behind us. He's a younger person, isn't he? Uh, he's, I think he's in his fifties, so he's you know oh. half half a generation behind me. But yes, incredibly smart and incredibly precocious, and uh, and a really remarkably impressive person. Aligning with your heroes in medicine, uh, I shocked a person with the. Uh, one of my heroes was this old rheumatologist. Uh, he wasn't current with New England Journal. Annals of Internal Medicine, he, he knew some articles, but he wasn't that professor who would just zap you with, have you read this? And uh, to George's credit, he taught me, I hope I've kept it with me. Uh, we were doing, remember radiology rounds when you go down to that dark room and sit in that priest-like environment? We were getting ready uh, to do radiology rounds. We were going down there, and George passed this little porcelain soul in the hallway on a stretcher with this little, thin little sheet. And this poor little lady was just there, and there's no one. It was 5.30, 6 o'clock at night. There's no one around. George stopped, talked to her. She didn't know what floor she was on. She didn't know anything. She was confused. And... Uh, George dropped everything. Uh, he sent a couple of us uh, to start calling around and trying to find out if somebody has a patient down in radiology. He sent me over to the emergency room to get warm blankets mm -hmm. uh, because this poor soul needed some blankets because she was literally clutching this little thin sheet. And uh, it stuck with me forever that mm -hmm. that was what medicine was about, was finding where the warm blankets were, not in arcanely debating what's a finding for rheumatoid arthritis and what isn't. That's a lovely story. Yeah. I cannot thank you enough, uh, Professor. Uh, Dr. Wachter, you add so much and you continue to add so much. Uh, it, I am honored to have you on The Doctor Is In, and uh, I can't wait for your next book. Well, thank you, Frank. I enjoyed it very much and keep up the great work. Okay. And for those of you out there who have taken the time to go on this journey, keep yourself safe and uh, wish you all good things. This world has been tough at times, 
I think we're getting to the better side of it right now. Again, thanks everybody for the doctors in. <laughs>